making sure I'll give me just a second from the beginning. Okay. Um, I want to start off by saying that my interest in education, in politics, started when I became a mom. And at that point, then I started asking, you know, trying to figure out what was going on with education issues. And when I found out what was going on, that's when I started becoming an activist. And so a lot of this got started. Um, it was in the late 1980s, the early 1990s, that I've been following education and following education down in Olympia since that time period. Um, which, so I do have a lot of understanding of the history, and I'm going to be sharing some of that with you. What's going on? Because we have to look at the whole education as a process, as a system, not just to stand alone and not just Common Core. To start with, though, I want to point out what we're dealing with is that we need a reality check. So is this a Coke bottle on the street? Is, is it clear for everyone? Or, or is that a drawing, sidewalk drawing? And it is a sidewalk drawing. The second picture I have is another sidewalk drawing. And that man on the ledge is actually standing on the sidewalk. And there are people that will approach this picture and walk around it so they don't fall in the hole. <laughs> what I want to point out is your eyes, your ears, your smell can deceive you. And that what we always have to consider is where is the truth? Where's that reality check going? What I will be talking about and the deception that's going on in the world today, whether it's Agenda 21 or whether it's education, has nothing to do with if, if you're smart or dumb, or if you are Republican or Democrat, a liberal or conservative, good person or a bad person. It just is. And that we have to not look at each other or not look at the people that we will be seeing possibly as the leaders of this as being bad people. It's just that we are, every one of us are being deceived. Some more than others, but we're all being deceived. Today I was asked to talk about Common Core. Common Core is the name of a set of standards that was brought into America starting in around the year 2010. And in Washington State, it was brought into Washington State in 2010. Common Core was brought in because we are told that all the governors and all the leaders of the state superintendents of every state got together and said this is a great thing and said we're going to endorse it and they actually copyrighted it. This is a document that's copyrighted. So at what point does 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 get copyrighted? Can knowledge be copyrighted? Just something to think about. But this set of words, this set of standards is copyrighted. And every state that does adopt the set of standards adopts this document as is. And by state law, you cannot change it more than 15%. So if you feel that your students deserve a higher set of standards, you can't do that by law. Senate Bill 6696. We are told that it is high standards, and I'm going to show you that it's really not high standards. We are told that we're going to have better testing systems. And one of the things that I hear from many people is that we have to have this new system of education because what we're doing in Washington State is terrible. We've had the WASO, we had the Measurement Student Progress, we had the high school proficiency exam, and we have end of course testing. And we've got all these different things going on. We need to get to one thing. And so they look at this new test called Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium is creating as the answer, the solution. But I'm going to poke some holes into that as a solution as well. And then you're told it's portability. And, um, portability means that we have to have it so every state can be the same. We need to have it so that one, you move from one state to another state, we're all going to be the same. Portability, the MIC is the Military Interstate Compact. 45 states currently sign a Military Interstate Compact. What that addresses is that if your student moves from one state to another, it, in, it addresses the issue of portability. We have already addressed, we have laws on the books 
that help kids that move from one state to another state. So we don't need to have a new law. And we need to have global competence. But I keep talking about Common Core as being not just a set of standards, it's something more. We have to look at it as a system of education. In that system of education, we have first shared vision to the set of standards. Oops. And that is the Common Core standards. That's step one. Next step we have is a new test, a new assessment piece. Then the third step is that you're going to change the textbooks or change curriculum or change the methods of teaching, it's pedagogy. And then fourth, to do all of this, you have to be able to control the leaders. You have to control the leaders with money and manipulation. In our case, with education, it's also teacher evaluations. So you have this one, two, three. You have standards, you have change of testing the standards, and then you have the change of the details of how you're going to teach. Every time Washington State has had a change in standards, they've done one, two, three. We had a new set of standards back in 1993, and then we had a WASO test, and then we had a change in curriculum. The next biggest change would be 2008 when the math standards changed. We changed the standards, and all of a sudden we had to change the testing system, and of course, and then we now are changing the textbooks. 2010, with the Duke Common Core, change of standards. Now we're going to be changing the testing system and changing the details. So you can't just have a change of standards without changing the next two things. So con consider again conceptually, if two plus two is equal to four, and we're really testing two plus two is equal to four, then why do we have to change the test every time? <laughs> So there's something else going on when you change the standards. You're changing something more than knowledge. So consider that the concept of standards is not tied to knowledge. It's tied to something else. This is systems thinking in schools. Just to kind of give you an idea, this is a 2012 conference that teachers, that the, the powers that be, understand systems thinking. So it's never just changing common core standards. It's going to be changing an entire system of delivering of education. How do we get here? Let's start with 1965, when we had the first Elementary and Secondary Education Act. That was the, one of the beginnings of when the federal government decided to put their fingertips into education. Prior to that, all 50 states were doing their own thing. After 1965, we got some assistance and help and suggestions from the federal government on how to do education. Then we had the creation of the Department of Education in 1979, and that created a whole bureaucracy now of not just this agency in Washington, D.C., but it came with nine education laboratories. The nation was divided into sections, and each section had a territory of a organization bureaucracy to assist the people in that section. It was interesting that they called it educational laboratories. What happens in laboratories? Experimentation. So all of a sudden with this creation of the Department of Education with nine education laboratories, Northwest Regional Education Laboratory is the one that we have in um, Oregon, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, our Northwest area. Then in the beginning, it was 1994, we had the beginning of something called standards-based movement. This is the key change right there. It introduced a new concept called standards, or performance standards. And they introduced and said, we're going to have this new baseline of what we're going to teach to. And most of us think that the standards is equivalent to knowledge. Again, as we're going to start seeing, that history will prove that the standards is not equivalent to knowledge, the actual core concepts of knowledge. Then we have in 2000, later, um, 2001, goals 2000, and with the passage of that, they said everybody needs to have a test to teach them the standards. And then we have, along with that, No Child Left Behind, that says 
we're not going to leave any child behind, so we're going to start putting more hammers and, and just more switches to that test and make sure that everyone has a test. We created the new set of standards, and now we have a new testing system. And all 50 states were encouraged to take federal money and develop their own set of tests to match their own set of standards. So we have a federal government that started off in 1994 saying, all oh, 50 states, I want you to be unique, make it local, develop your own set of standards. And we're going to have to help you develop your own set of tests to go with it. And now, hit 2010, oh my goodness, we have 50 different states with 50 different <laughs> sets of standards and 50 different testing systems we need to consolidate. That's what's going on. So we have the same federal agency that recommended to develop all 50 different systems, now saying we need to consolidate. Um, wait, there's a question. I'll, I'll take just a couple as we go along, but not a lot. Sure, just real quick. What's the common core formulated by a communist at Stanford University? I'm not joking. Uh, a communist who said that we needed to have the same educational standards as the third world does, so we have to lower our education standards and bring up Mexico so we're all the same, the media are the same throughout the whole world. I think what, what you're saying is that there, it sounds like you're saying that there is a certain specific body of people that developed it. I think you're on the right track conceptually. But when I track the money and the names and the people, mm -hmm. um, what I actually found since you brought it up, I have a contract signed in 1993 by a couple of non-government organizations that assisted Washington State in writing the Wasso standards, the Ehlers, and writing our Wasso test. The names on that document are the same names as the authors of Common Core, Bill Darrow, Mark Tucker. I just want, so, so that's what I see is, is that there is an agenda, there is people that started it back in 1993, and now they've moved forward, they went to different organizations, but they've come back. It's the same cast of characters that have now come back and are behind Common Core. So how does the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation fit into this? They pay for everything. And they encourage it through their money. <laughs> so I bring this out, outcome-based education. In 1990s, 1991, 92, I told you that was when my daughter was just hitting that point where she's going to be in kindergarten. And I'm trying to make that decision. Do I put my child in public school or private school? And I'm leaning towards private school, but I thought, you know, intellectually and honestly, I'm making a judgment call and I don't know anything about schools. So I decided to get on the panel of the Strategic Planning Committee of the Kent School District, which was the third largest district at the time. So I was then in, at the ground level of the introduction of this entire performance-based system in the Kent School District for three years. I was on the Strategic Planning Committee, then on the Performance Assessment Committee. When I did that, what they kept telling us is they're teaching all the parents and all those dummies that don't know anything about education how to understand education, and they brought out these articles on Johnson City Schools. And I'm reading these newspaper articles and other magazine articles about Johnson City, and I'm saying, well, wait a minute, you know, I raise my hand. It says outcome-based education. But yet you're telling me I'm on the performance-based education committee. And they said, shh, it's the same thing, but we're going to do it better. <laughs> this was my clue that the concept of standards-based education the concept of performance-based education, the concept of the word education reform, has to do with outcomes. Outcomes of what the child will look like. Now, if the outcomes are based on knowledge, that could be a good thing. But what if the outcomes are based on having the right values, attitudes, and beliefs, and thinking? So I want you to keep that in mind because it could be good, or it could be bad. And it's up to all of you now to go back to seeing what is actually going on in the classroom and say, which way do we, let's connect the dots. Is it this way or is it that way? And let's just be honest and say, oh my gosh, it is looking this way. And if I'm wrong, then it should be looking at knowledge. So that's how I look at it is, okay, I have this theory. Is it going to be good or is it going to be going differently? And as I watched over the past 20 years, I watched it take a, a turn, which is why I'm convinced now of, of things I'm going to, that I'm saying today. 
In addition, in 1989, Dr. Shirley McCune, who was the mother of Title IX, worked in the Department of Education, was one of the head of the laboratories, the regional laboratories. She made certain comments at a conference for all the national governors, and she did get a standing ovation. Curriculum is not simply putting some facts in kids' minds, and it isn't teaching the past history of the world. We no longer see the teaching of facts and information as a primary outcome of, of education. The earlier we can intervene in the lives of people, the more effective we can be. Think Department of Early Learning. And the purpose of education and schools is to change the thoughts, feelings, and actions of children. And good teaching is defined as challenging children's fixed beliefs. Is that Carl Marx? That is Dr. Shirley McHugh, who made these statements. And she's important. She was actually, she was in Kansas um, working at the Education Laboratory out of Kansas, out of Columbine at the time. So do you have to correct the focus on the... Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Andrea. Sorry, I have to take my glasses off to read. <laughs> so I'm not sure uh, how it's my go. eyes. Okay. But I just want to point out, she is very important for everyone here in this room in Washington State because Dr. Terry Bergerson hired Shirley McCune to help part the Russell in the late 1990, about 1995, 96. And Dr. Shirley McCune is in charge of what we have today with our Washington State education system. Side note, she wrote a book called The Light Shall Set You Free. This is her, picture of her. So she has some alternative theories and philosophies on life that could be embedded in our education system. And when I was doing uh, freedom of information requests, I spent two years or so down in the basement of our Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction looking at records. And I found this man in his book. And this is, uh, talks about how the Assistant Superintendent of Public Instruction for the State of Washington is participating in a revolutionary education design with Dr. Shirley McCune and Dr. Terry Bergenson, bringing the new set of three R's. Okay, so, I mean, you can look at this later. This kind of cued me in that there's something other than knowledge being taught. There's something new going on, and Washington State is being <coughs> experimented on, these two books. Plus, we found $13 million of contracts from the federal government to create this system. So what is, what is this change that I'm talking about? Well, it's hard to read this, but 1993, Washington State passed a law that changed everything. Prior to 1993, education was what they called scope and sequence. You have a bit of knowledge. First graders are going to learn how to read letters and do simple math problems in second grade. You start expanding on that, increasing your vocabulary, writing. So there are, there are specific steps of knowledge that each child was supposed to learn at each grade level. Then, in 1993, with the new law, they took all of that out and they said, education is to become responsible citizens to contribute to their, their economic well-being and to that of their families and communities, and to be productive and lead satisfying lives. That is the definition of education in Washington State in 1993. Today, the definition of education in Washington State is a basic education is an evolving program of instruction that is intended to provide students with the opportunity to become responsible and respectful global citizens mm -hmm. and to enjoy productive and satisfying lives. RCW 28A 152.10. Well, what it is, because <coughs> what they're really saying is that all children are supposed to work and be happy. So what do we have? An entire education system that is based upon college and career readiness. So if you happen to be one of those types of people, I'm going to pick on women here, that say that I'm going to raise my kids and stay at home. You know, that's not allowed under this new concept, <laughs> because you're not working. And so everything about education is geared to college and career. The outcome that you will go to college and that you will have a career. Not necessarily the outcome of knowledge. We're told again that all the state superintendents and governors wanted this and I just point out that Robert Scott, superintendent of Texas, which is one of the states that did not sign on to Common Core, first he said that standards-based test which is um, standardized test-based, which is the performance-based system, 
is a perversion of what a quality education should be. He recognized that. And he recognized that this constant performance standards is not really education. And he also said, I was told I needed to sign a letter agreeing to Common Core. I asked if I might read it first, and I was told they hadn't been written, but they still wanted my signature. I'm going to pass it so we can find out what's yes. in it. <laughs> You're told Common Core is high standards. Common Core <clears throat> is a B plus in English and an A minus in math. I told I, I had mentioned earlier that Washington State used to have F-rated standards in mathematics. There's an organization called the Fordham Foundation. Fordham Foundation ranks every all 50 states in their standards, and Washington State was ranked an F in English, an F in history, a D in geography, F in math, and a C in science. So when your child passed the WASO <laughs> in the year 2006, know that your child passed a set of standards that are F-rated. I can bring them give an example of that. I graduated in 2000 from high school and I came from Washington State and I was in accelerated programs here. When I moved to Iowa, I was three months behind everyone else because they not only give their kids homework over the summer that they have to do in the accelerated programs, but I was behind just the regular grammar and everything math. Yeah, so I had to do extra work tutoring and everything to catch up because just to be in the same class as I was in in Washington. The, the level of expectation <coughs> is not high. So a group of parents got together, lobbied the legislators. We forced our legislators to come up with A plus standards in 2008. Now we're back down to A minus. I mean, part of our argument was we as citizens were able to affect change, local control over our own state. If we go to a national set of standards, Common Core, if you don't like what you see, you have to go to Washington, D.C. to try to affect change. It's out of our hands in Washington State now, now that we've committed Common Core. There are three states that were consistently high, A plus standards, California, Indiana, Massachusetts, and kind of change. Um, I think we have a different set of top three there, but for probably since 2004 to 2010, 2009, these three states were top. Why didn't the designers of Common Core simply go to the top three states and say, hey guys, you're doing something right, we want to copy you. We mm -hmm. want to set a standard for the nation. They right. didn't do that. And then there are some people who say, well, you know, um, it's not the highest set of standards, but it's better than what we already have. I, I get that argument a lot too. You know, but if you're sitting in a set of standards, don't you want excellence? Mm -hmm. Standards doesn't mean you have to be there. Standards just says this is what we're hoping for. So we have a set of standards that's down here now. That's what the Common Core did. The other thing they did not do, they didn't go to the foreign countries, China, Singapore, and Japan, and say, hey, you're doing something right, we want to copy you. They did not do that. Why is standards are important? This house right there, is in the midst of a huge development. Hurricane Ike comes along, washes everything down, smashes it. It's the last house standing. Why? This house was built above standard. It was not built to build a code, it was built above standard. It was excellent, that's why it's standing. Like building codes, if this is just the average kid, standard is the average, there is no excellence. And the problem is, if you want to build this house in the minds of a child, want to build that child to be excellent, we have a cap in Washington State. We can't be more excellent than 15%. <coughs> so so that, that's what we've committed to now with this new law. Talk about assessments. We think of testing. <coughs> you may remember the Iowa Test of Basic Skills. It's called a norm reference test. Norm reference test means that it's when everyone takes the test, everyone's taking the same test, and you can create an average. And that when you take the test, at the Iowa test, they know that this grade represents the average of all you know, thousands and thousands of third graders across the nation. And they can tell you when, you when you take that test, you act like, you know, your result is like other third graders, or below, or above. They can norm you that way. Criteria reference test means that you have been able to successfully achieve the criteria. 
So it really is dependent how good your criteria is to see how good your test is. As we have seen, the WASO had an F-rated set of criteria. <coughs> so when kids pass that test, they pass the F-rated set of standards. The Common Core test is also a criteria reference test. And it's so the criteria, the testing system will be as good as the criteria of the standards. This example here is, is from the Washington State, I think it's a 10th or 11th, uh, 2010 or 2011 fourth grade test. It has a question. Every third child is worn red, every fifth child is wearing purple shirts. What color shirt is the 15th child wearing? I bring that up because you don't have to have any numbers. This is a math question. <laughs> you don't have to have numbers. Your answer could be the 15th child is wearing red and blue, or your answer could be purple. That is an acceptable answer for that test question. That is how the Common Core test would be like. When I was in Idaho, I happened to have the opportunity to be in a conference put on by the superintendent of Idaho, the State, I'm sorry, State Board of Education of Idaho. And they were talking to superintendents about the Common Core test. And they said, the math test is not about math. The writing test is not about in, uh, punctuation, spelling, or grammar. They said that the Common Core test is going to have more than one right or wrong answers. And they explained a lot of things. And I went up to the facilitator at break, and I said, you know, I'm from Washington State. It seems to me what you're describing is very much like the test we have in Washington State called the WASO. And they said to me, and he said to me, perhaps Washington State was awarded the contract to write the Common Core test because they're the only state that knows how to do it right. <laughs> Just to let you know, many people, legislators, others will say, we need to have a new testing system because we have been so poorly, we have measurement student progress, we have the wall, so we've done all these different things. We need something new for the kids. Well, just know and be very assured that Washington State holds the contract and is writing the test for the nation on the WASO, I mean, on the Common Core test. And in the contract between the Department, Federal Department of Education and Washington State, it actually says that the AI, Artificial Intelligence Scoring Methodology, will be firmly established and recognized as valid and reliable scoring platform by the year 2015. Should this assumption not be met, we will develop backup plans that involve higher rates of human scoring to support or supplant the AI process. Don't you feel confident that the new Common Core test is valid and reliable? It is something that's never been done before. It's 100% on the computer, using not just computer programming that's never been done before, but theories behind the computer writing that has never been done before. And in about two years, Washington State students are going to be completely on the system. And wasn't it like no educators were involved in writing it? It's mostly, Token. Well, I heard, but there was no real, it's mostly like business people writing it, not, um, not so much someone who's uh, Possibly, like anything it's else, really any educators, um, like in writing the standards, there are token educators that were on the panel. Sarah Sandra Stotsky and James Milgram were the mathematician, James Milgram, and the English person that was the expert in their fields and they refused to sign on to the Common Core Standards because it was not up to standard. They, they could not put the name on uh, The reason I have the birdhouse, one of the things that I think is going on, and this is from studying the WASO, is we have this different concept of testing. And I don't want to say it's better or not, it's just different. And this is one of the reasons why some of the test questions will be very, very difficult and why the WASO has been very difficult. If I was going to give a test to fourth graders on how to build a build house, my mind would be you teach them the different parts. Day one, you teach them how to cut, uh, to just draw the, um, the, the frame to the different parts. Then day two, you may just spend the whole lesson cutting the wood. And day three, maybe cutting the little circle. Day four, so what you're doing is you're learning the different skills of the different components of making the bird house. <coughs> and each day, you teach the child a particular set of skills, cutting wood drawing, um, hammering, you know, different things. What the Common Core test is doing, and I think what the boss has done is they said, build the bird, bird, birdhouse. 
And so they didn't necessarily make sure that you had the different tools. But what I keep seeing in the suggestions to the testing system is that each child must look into introspection and look into themselves to figure out which tools they need to build that birdhouse. And they have to decide, what do I need, what don't I need? Do I need a screwdriver? Do I need a hammer? Do I need a popsicle stick? And so the child has to now determine, what do I need to build this birdhouse? It's a bigger concept, which is made up of a bunch of little concepts. Now this can work if the child has learned the detailed little concepts. But what I think is going on in this outcome-based system, the outcome is build the birdhouse, is that the focus has gone away from the details of the individual's tools of knowledge. So kids who have not mastered multiplication, division, and all those little tools of knowledge are going to have a harder time building the final product. That's one of the differences I see on the testing system that we're going into. I talked about portability. I talked about some of the other things now. Portability, this is my reminder. Portability, when I looked at the inter military interstate compact, what I saw was that there are other things that were more important than standards as being a key issue on moving from one state to another state. Some of the major issues are, if you're a senior and you change schools, can you graduate? If you love sports and you come to a new school in January and you miss the, the uh, tryouts for the baseball team, can you play baseball? Those are some of the key issues of moving from one state to another. What I did not see was a real focus on did they have a certain academic standard? Because there will always be differences in children, always be differences in what a teacher can teach as their average, you know, what, what they focus on, because everyone is different. And whether you're in Bellevue or inner city Seattle, you're still gonna have that difference. So having the same set of standards, expectations, doesn't always mean that you can have that transition real easily. And so I, I see that portability as, as not being a strong case. And then here's the other catch, which is interesting. When you talk to teachers and superintendents about the Common Core test, one of the things they'll tell you is that the test is really great because when your child answers a question, depending on if it gets it right or wrong, the next question can be different. It's interactive, computerized. Which means that no two children are taking the same test. Now, how can you have comparability? Just because you have if, if the testing mechanism is not comparable. So it's something else to consider thinking about. It's <coughs> not just about the portability of state to state. Okay. The other item is global competence. You're made to think that we need to have common core because we have to be competitive in the global market and you're minor thinking, okay, competitiveness means that I'm gonna have the knowledge you know, the Asian countries have done very well and they have rigor in their mathematics and, and all of that. So people perceive that Common Core is going to put them on that channel. Well, one of the things I did find was a study on Asian countries and one of the things they focus on is rote memorization and kill and drill. And that's not in America's education system. But I also found a piece by the Council of Chief State School Officers on global competence. Their definition, so the authors of Common Core, the, the owners of it, the uh, CCSSO, Council of Chief State Schools Officers, define global competence as the capacity and disposition to understand and act on issues of global significance. That they can recognize perspectives, communicate ideas, and take action. What this just told me, this is from the Asia Society website, is that the Asia Society and the authors of Common Core have partnered together to define global competence as being diversity and cultural respect. It is not about knowledge. It's about understanding different countries. And so keep that in mind as you start really getting into the concept of global competence. In Washington State, there is a document that was found years ago called Teaching and Learning Mathematics. It is defining what good math is and what bad math is. So it says it's dysfunctional 
that the goal of mathematics is to provide the correct answer. This is teaching teachers to teach math. So having the correct answer is dysfunctional. That the nature of math activity is to recall and apply algorithmic procedures appropriate to the solution, computation skills, dysfunctional. That the nature of math knowledge is that everything is either right or wrong with no allowance for gray area. This is considered dysfunctional in Washington State. If you wondered about the teachers, well, teachers aren't going to do that. This is a professional development manual of the year 2006. In this manual, on page 22, it says, if students believe there are right or wrong answers to questions and work to determine what those are, and students come up with immediate responses, that teacher is below standard. It's a bad teacher. So what does a good teacher in Washington State look like? Students know their ability to construct understanding and think reflectively about a problem is more valuable than correct answers. Again, so there are two different concepts of teaching. One is the concept of teaching knowledge, and the concept of the teacher is supposed to stand in front of the room and teach knowledge. It's what I call the sage on the stage is one of the concepts. Or the guide on the side where the teacher's role is to facilitate the children to come to their own understanding on how to create the knowledge. That's called constructivism, where the children develop their own ways to add and subtract, modify, and divide. So we have this concept of logical thinking skills. In Washington State, one of the top books for teaching middle school math is this book here called Connected Math Project. Tell me when you see numbers. When a child did not pass the wassail, they were given summer school in this book. This is called constructivism. What grade level? Oh, what? Eighth grade geometry. Eighth grade. <clears throat> Great. And in another book that I have, it is um, <clears throat> when they talk about how to find surface areas. You look count the numbers in the grid. You'd, they did not teach the concept of 3.14 pi. You're counting the number in the grid. You have a question back there? Were these so-called experts who wrote up these crappy standards high on drugs when they wrote this up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Were they, were they um, too much pi? I believe the that they did have a different viewpoint of philosophy of life. Why do we stand I, for this garbage? This is America. We should have higher educational standards. That's this crap. True. Well, that's why I'm telling you this. Thank you. Because... <laughs> This book here, Connected Math, is now coming back in some schools. I was in Centralia School District, and they said it was coming back. But if you don't have this book in your area here, and I believe Allensburg had this book for middle school math, you might have another series of books called <coughs> Everyday Math. Under the book Everyday Math, this is the teacher's manual to help parents understand the new concepts. <laughs> what exactly is algorithm invention? Algorithm invention means that your child creates and shares her own problem-solving methods instead of simply learning a set of prescribed standard algorithms. In other words, she becomes an active participant in developing comp computation strategies. After the students have had plenty of opportunities to invent computation strategies, the teacher may discuss certain standard algorithms. And in this book, the children are asked to learn how to add. They have to know the left to right algorithm, the partial sums algorithm, the rename Adams algorithm, the left to right algorithm, the rename subtraction algorithm, and two unusual subtraction algorithms. And the kids are told you have to know three out of the five methods of adding, even if you get the answer wrong. This is real. This is what's happening, and I've talked to parents who's. So, and anyone who's been in this book, Everyday Math, will recognize the lattice method. If you don't know the lattice method, your child has not been in everyday math. This is elementary school. My son has those great, the other books that you the He's in first grade. First grade. Mm -hmm. um, so it's probably Turk, which investigation is. So what we have going on is a change in how they teach mathematics. And this is nationwide. Mm -hmm. This is another connected math book. This, this particular question says, numbers. My special number. Many people have a number they find interesting. Choose a whole number between 10 and 100 that you especially like. In your journal, record your number, explain why you chose that number, list three or four mathematical things about your number, and list three or four connections you can make between your number and the real world. This is sixth grade math book. 
her numbers. Oh, she Oh, my goodness. So, I got to looking at different math books. I've been looking at math books for many years now. I call them, this is my fuzzy math books. I bring the worst, of course. And um, then I call hazy math books, uh, which is not a bad. The difference is hazy math books have numbers in it, but they don't necessarily ask you to arrive at the correct answer. So there's a question back there? I just, I'm missing the link between bad math curriculum, which no school district should have adopted, and common core. Um, the link would be, when you look at common core, what the delivery system of common core, and thank you for bringing that up, that you have the standards change, then you have a testing system that changes, so there's no right or wrong answers in the testing system, and then you have to go to the next level of the changes in curriculum. What I'm seeing is that the changes in curriculum that is being asked of, of teachers and schools when they, quote, implement Common Core, some of the schools are bringing this book back in, the school system. Because now they're teaching to the test. Right. They're not and teaching the, the, the whole subject as a thing. They they're want their kids changing, to pass the test. They're changing the curriculum like to match the test. So the mm -hmm. question is, is it good or is it bad? And the state of Idaho has on their website, this is one of their newly recommended books. So I'm, I'm seeing nationwide that they're going to this concept of fuzzy math. I'm just bringing in right now some more examples of what fuzzy math looks like and the impact of fuzzy math on a child. So am, am I understanding correctly? I mean, these, these books here are not necessarily part of Common Core, but Common Core is taking this factual relativism, as it were, and making it more standardized. And so it's basically taking it's, this concept and making it totally right, the norm. Because under the one, two, three system, they change the standards, they change the test. Now the next step, which we, we are at, is could it be good changes or bad changes? And what I'm seeing is more of this kind of stuff as the bad changes. But this is also where you as parents can take back control. Watch what's going on, and when they implement Common Core, if they're starting to bring in concepts of constructivism, concepts of, of you know, no right or wrong answers, then you have to say, where is it in Common Core that we have to have no right or wrong answers? Because it's not there. That, there is none. You can fill it with good stuff. And that's where parents have to get active and demand that even though we're stuck with these standards, we can fill it up with good stuff. That's that's. Uh, one more question and then I'll get back to this. You've made the comment several times that as a state, we are, you might say, in concrete with this program. Washington State is in concrete with this program because that's just the philosophy of our, our Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. Okay. And Washington State is developing the test. So the concepts and the philosophy of the test, which are driven by this philosophy of the creators of the WASO, are bringing some of these concepts back into the Common Core testing system, because that's all they know. Okay, I'm going I'm to go on to this. Who in Washington State <coughs> is developing the test? Joe is this Wilcox? a committee? Is this a, a The contract was awarded to the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction under the division called Smarter Balance Assessment. And the man who is the key lead guy on the program is named jo Joseph Wilhoft. So by name, follow the names and people. <laughs> Joe Wilhoft uh, was quoted in the Seattle Times in March of 2006 as Wasser writing, make it up as you go along. So his philosophy on how to design tests, because he designed the Wasso, are now driving into this new Common Core test that he is, he is, is the lead is, designer on. I'm trying to visualize this. This is a bunch of people that get together yeah. and write these texts. And who are these people? And how are they chosen to participate? Um, there is a lead committee. And, and I, I think a lot of this has already been done. I don't know who created the test designs itself. But a lot of it, um, they, a lot of products has already been developed. And now they're just rolling it out. So I think that the same designers that were involved in writing the WASO have been behind the scenes for the past years, possibly, I mean, possibly writing that. But I know that the lead man on the project developing the test for the nation, by name, is one of the people that are the father of the WASO. So, 
So that's why, and then when I see these concepts, no right or wrong answers, and when I see other states, um, when you see other states say, wait a minute, what's going on with Common Core? We may not want to do this. I'm watching other states walk away from the testing system, and I think they are facing Washington State testing system for the first time and say, no, we don't want to participate in it. So you're going to watch other states walk away from the testing system. But I'm going back. After looking at the whole concept of math, and my world is math, being a tax accountant, and I, I was trained as a CPA, that the discipline of applying logic to facts to resolve one answer is what math is all about. And what happens if you take away discipline of the mind? What happens if you take away that rote memorization, that routine, over and over again, trying to come to a correct answer? We may not have been good at math, but our parents, our teacher, we missed recess, we couldn't watch our favorite TV show because our parents said, you're going to sit down and you're going to do your math problems. And we did it over and over to try to come to the correct answer. Mm -hmm. That teaches us something called discipline of the mind. It's a character trait. We learned logical thinking skills. If, then, this, then, that. Based on facts, and we came up with something called absolute right or wrong answers. And absolute right or wrong also helps us understand the concept of truth and lies, and of good and bad, good and evil. When you know that there's a line between something, right and wrong answers, and there's a line, it helps us understand what is appropriate behavior and inappropriate behavior, because we know where that line is. We are creating a generation of children that don't know there is a line, that don't understand discipline, that feel that anything goes because there's no cause and effect. You have cause, 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 but no effect. You have no finality, you have no conclusions. There's no consequences. So in all of this math, what I'm seeing is a change in the character of the nature of children. Then I add in this concept of the pyramid of knowledge. This is Bloom's taxonomy. It used to be that you have knowledge, you have restating of knowledge, you have problem solving, then you start adding knowledge from one area to another area, science and language arts and things. But you go up and you have now brainstorming, and at the top is judgment. This is called lower order thinking skills. It's lower order not because it's inferior, it's because it's foundational. And so we have lower order thinking skills and higher order thinking skills. We now have an education system that is focused on higher order thinking skills. And we have bought into it. Oh, I'm so happy my kids are learning critical thinking skills. I just love it. They come back when they have all these critical thinking skills and they're learning all the higher order thinking skills. And we're proud of them. But when you think this through, they're learning how to have the right evaluation of judgment the higher order thinking skills, without necessarily having the basis of the knowledge that you go to that judgment. And when you think about it, many of the higher order thinking skills, the critical thinking skills questions that you see coming home from your children's schoolwork are going to be moral judgment. Mm -hmm. One of the top critical thinking skills question is the lifeboat. How many of you know about the lifeboat question? That is you have a lifeboat that seats eight people. You have nine people. And they might give professions. You've got the, the chaplain, you've got the teacher, you've got the mother, the doctor. Which one do you kill? And most of the children are told, you have to choose one of those. That's your critical thinking skill question. So when I started looking at the concept of critical thinking skills, it could be in the back of a math book, a chapter in your history book. Kind of look at that and say, is this a judgment call? This is a moral judgment call. Because in an outcome-based system, the focus is to have the right outcome of thought, not necessarily the inputs of knowledge. So I developed then that I believe we are creating a new culture. Now, I grew up in Japan, so I grew up in two cultures, the American culture and the Japanese culture. And it taught me that there are just automatic ways of thinking, minds of thinking. And in this case, one culture in America is what I call the rock thinker. I think every one of you in the room is a rock thinker. 
Wrong thinkers base their decisions on looking at the logic of facts. They do cause and effect, and they come up with an answer. And there is a concept called truth that doesn't change. On the other hand, there is a concept called the lava lamp thinker. <laughs> the lava lamp thinker floats around this warm body of water, and they feel really good More because all the friends are in the warm body of water. <laughs> and so when they make their decisions, they take their cues from the glob in their lava lamp. But if they break off and go to a new glob, that becomes their new truth. And they don't seem to realize it's a 180 degree difference from what they thought yesterday. So for an example, we're going to go to lunch. We have rock thinkers and we have lava lamp thinkers. The rock thinker is going to go to lunch and they're going to say, OK, what's on the menu? Well, let's see. I've got 30 bucks in my pocket, so I have a financial limitation. I have a diet restriction. I had lunch yesterday. I don't want another chicken sandwich. I had that yesterday. I mean, there's different facts that help us make our decision on what to order for lunch. The lava lamp thinker, on the other hand, walks in the restaurant and is already looking, hmm, what's that person eating? What's that person eating? OK, I'm ready to order. I noticed that seven people ordered liver, three people ordered chicken sandwiches, two roast beef, and one soup. So I'm going to have liver. I don't know if I like liver. I don't care how much it costs, but the majority of the people order liver, so I'm going to order it too. <laughs> That's just kind of a, a quick example that the concept of a lava lamp thinker, it's all marketing, imagery, and numbers. So when I go and I'm going to be talking to a legislator or a leader, I have to assess, am I talking to a rock thinker or a lava lamp thinker? If I'm talking to a rock thinker, I will take my facts and I'll take my list and my documents and get, take a look at this. If I'm talking to a lava lamp thinker, I can either cry, show emotion, <laughs> I can bring more numbers in, get more guys on my side than the others, make my glove big, or what I call the rock star image. The rock star image is that if you have somebody famous, that's a big glob in itself. So if you have somebody famous on your side, on your cause, it attracts other globs to it because they're already a big glob. So politically, I'm actually assessing how am I going to lobby this legislation based upon are they rock or are they lava lamp? Ultimately, more guys on your side, the better it is. You have to get more guys on your side than they have on theirs. So again, we talk about connecting the dots. With everything that I said, if you have any questions, fact check me. Don't believe what I said. I will give you, in fact, I do have a small list. Um, I didn't have a lot of handouts that have some, some of the URLs of some of the things I talked about today so that you can have that with you. But we have to make sure that, that you consider what am I looking at? Is it, is she right or is she wrong? You know, talking about me. And, and look at your curriculum. Which way is it? Is it really giving knowledge and concrete answers? Or are we in this moral judgment type of world? So take a look at what's happening with the curriculum as we unroll. And school districts are now coming out saying, we are making these changes because of Common Core. In Tri-Cities, a teacher was told, you are doing too much direct teaching. Meaning you are, you're doing too much standing in front of the room explaining how to do a math problem. And she was actually written up for that as a negative thing. So that told me that there is something more going on. Tracking system, website called Data Quality Campaign. <clears throat> that, this website tells you how far along each state is on the tracking system. Almost all 50 states to tracking system money. And so this tells you where you are on it. And what does that mean by tracking system? It's called the data warehouse. There is a system where you're going to have, this is actually from Kentucky. Department of Early Learning, K-12, your higher ed, your teacher, all your teacher uh, professional development. It could even go into your employment uh, CPEs, uh, professional education, and your workforce. Are all that information about you is going to go into a data warehouse. And then the users, it's going to be the K-20 education, the public, researchers, all those end users. Washington State has this system of the data warehouse. I have legislators telling me that they're getting information on a P-20W computerized system. 
Now, right now, the Department of Labor Industries and Employment Security have access to your child's school records under the law that was passed. So, don't feel real bad. Some of you may be saying, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And oftentimes I'll have parents that say, what can I do for my kid? I believe, and the reason why I go around the state, actually the Northwest now, talking about education, is I believe that it is important that you save your own, the children around you. Your child, the children in your church, the children around you, your community. We need to take back the government and save our own children. Mm -hmm. And to understand what you need to do, you have to know what's going on, which is why I explained everything to you. So that some of the things may not be in your school yet. And there are wonderful teachers out there that need your support because they don't want to do all this stuff. And so we have to find those good teachers, find those good principals, and support them. And then support any laws that are changing so that we can preserve knowledge-based education for our children. I also talk to some grandparents that say, I don't know what to do. I don't want my grandchild to be in the system, but my daughter or my son, they don't understand the need to be more cautious. They, they think it's a great system. Remember that the, the, the public schools that you went to are not the same as the government schools of today. It's different. So even if it's the mm -hmm. same teacher, they're not being uh, taught teaching the same, they're not teaching the same way. I bring this up because I look at this, I think of it as a, like a sci-fi movie. This is incredible, as Violet. We have a force field. And the force field has kept our nation, whether it's, it's the marriage issue, whether it's education issue. We had this bubble around America, around Washington State, that protected us from some of these bad influences. Where well, the force field is down. And when that force field is down, because Washington State laws have torn it down. That, that it's up to us as individuals, up to us as communities, to build a new force field back up. And that can be done through getting together, that can be through knowledge, that can be showing up at school board meetings, and again, that can be done through prayer. And so I just wanted to let all of you know we need to start working on all those issues, but build up the force field. Just because the picture is so big, you don't know what to do, focus on the people around you, your families. Um, just one last note. One of the things that I did do was, and I, I'm hoping all of you got a handout, was Northwest Education Resource Network. Because I truly believe that we need to go back and save children one at a time, one child at a time, this is a new nonprofit <coughs> organization that's been created to do just that. It's to help a parent one-on-one, -on -one, help them um, buy books for their kids. And so if you are looking for a nonprofit that will help education, that will start trying to push back on what's happening to children's minds, this is the one to do. And I think it's the only one in the state of Washington where if you contribute, it's a 501c3. And so um, I'm, a group of friends and I have come together. We feel this is one of the mechanisms that we can use to start pushing back and bringing good knowledge into children. We also, I have a working relationship with the, all the Washington Federation of Independent Schools and the American Schools of Christian and International, the private school industries and the Catholic churches, so that we can help them as well. And if you can go to a school and say, I've got $5,000 that I will give to you, if you remove some of your fuzzy math books and put in good math books, the private school is going to say, okay, I'll listen to you. And there are private schools that unknowingly have purchased some of these types of books. And so what I want to do is to be able to go back to that school and say, hey, listen to this little presentation, and I will buy you 30 books for your one third grade class that you have. And that's all it takes. It doesn't take a lot of money, but then they will have a better understanding on what should, they should be doing rather than just looking up into the catalog or online, buying some of the bad books. So I have this working relationship with the private school sectors to get into the schools if I had that batch of money to say, here, I'll give this to you. Homeschoolers, I, I'm working with some homeschoolers and some other small private school co-ops to say, I'm going to help you get started. But if you can kind of spread the word, this is the organization to help donate to, to make that happen. Now, questions for here. It's my understanding that some of those 45 states that have been sucked into this vortex from 
Washington, D.C. are now having second thoughts. They are. Buyer's remorse in, in looking at getting out. They are, and I believe that's because step one happened 2010, 11. They had the standards. Now, <gasps> they're facing the test. So as the test starts to unroll, what many of the other states are seeing for the first time is the WASO on steroids. And they're saying, wait a minute, what's going on here? And I think that's the point, because I'm getting some emails from other states and teachers and Truth in American Education, it's another website, that's kind of making me wonder, they're looking at the test going, wait, what's going on with the test? And I think that's going to be the point where we can help other states push back. There's some questions back there. Oh, I was just going to say, my understanding is that I believe we are. Legislatively, and talking with um, when we were when we were trying to stop it, well, we were trying to slow it down in the first place. 2010, we said, "You haven't read the thing. Why are you voting on it?" And they said, "Okay, we'll have another law that says if the legislators proactively say slow, we will." But if the legislator does nothing, Randy Dorn moves forward. So in 2011, we had a big push to try to stop Common Core from coming into the state, and we lost. Could you just expand a little bit more on why you would want to change the question? Like, why do you want these laws to be in place? Because they are in place, and they have business to all these followers and do it. Part of it, um, Part of it, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, when you talk about Agenda 21, what if you were evil and you want to manipulate the world of all good-hearted, smart-thinking people, you have to change the way they come and make decisions. Mm -hmm. So this is what's going on. I mean, it's been going on since 1980s and 1990s. Now we're, you know, we're seeing a lot of it happening. But ultimately, the child that is the lava lamp thinker you come up and say, we need global, you know, global warming. Now, here we are freezing. The global warming scientists are stuck in a snowdrift. And, yeah, really. and, you, and so yet, yeah, they, they still real. want this, right? I mean, it, because again, it's not logic. It, and so, if you can manipulate an entire society to just go with the flow of whatever the media says, then you win. And so, the, there's, there's that to it. And, and I think there's just other layers of, um, Mar yeah, I mean, you've got the Marxism, you've got socialism, you've got other of the mm -hmm. isms controlling this. You've got good people, and there's the other good people that were just asleep at the wheel. We didn't know. We're, we're that frog in the iron pan. We didn't know that we needed to fight back. And so now all of a sudden it's hitting us because the system is done. It's a done deal. Okay, sorry. But individuals, we can fight As back. A parent, I have been asked to be honest. I would say go with your gut feeling on what you think knowledge is, the tools of knowledge. Um, <clears throat> what I see is that when you teach reading and writing, you first, you know, in the early grades, you know the difference between letters and numbers. Then you put the letters together to make words. You put the words together to make sentences, sentences together to make paragraphs, paragraphs to make essays. There's a flow of logic, and in between you learn grammar and spelling and how to diagram a sentence. The new way is persuasive writing. So kindergarten, draw a picture if you can't write to persuade people of the argument. So the entire Common Core is on concepts of narrative writing, persuasive writing. <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter what your grammar is, it doesn't matter what spelling is, as long as you get your ideas across. Now that can be a good thing, but when you forget, when, when you do that to the extent that you don't teach the basics, then we're getting in trouble. So depending on the age level, consider that there is a sequence of events of knowledge that has to be built upon. And if you don't see that, then you know that maybe we should go to a different book. The other thing you can do is email me, um, list of books. And I'm trying to put together on the website of Northwest Education Resource Network um, a website listing of books. Um, I would, math book, I would refer to Words of Math, where I'll send you links of other books. So stay in contact with me, get my card, and um, here and then back there. I guess the hardest thing I'm having with, my son's in first grade, 
and already I have trouble helping him with his homework because I don't understand why they're doing this or what it means. You know what I mean? Here's a first grade assignment. Here's the first and second grade they assignment. Don't, I, I, when you were talking about the, the test where it's sure. like, what color is number 15 or they do that all the time the patterns i get the pattern thing because you yeah. can predict an outcome right. later on but there he hardly ever comes home with real math problems and all, what they call he's very good at math. is um the decomposing numbers so let's study the number 12. 12 can be three times four 10 plus 2, mm -hmm. 6 times 2. So you study the number 12, but you're studying in a way where you're breaking it down. It is not studying the way of a number sentence. 2 plus 2 is equal to. Okay. Again, we talked about the number and progression of number sentence um, sequencing in language. Same thing in math. And we need to learn the sequencing of the number sentences um, and, and all of that. But that's not what's being taught to first and second graders. A question back there? Yeah, I understand that there's a catalog that comes out every so often, probably every right year, uh, to educators to choose their books. And can you share any information you may have about which Just catalog items are common core and which ones are not? Probably. So probably most of them will be common core now, and if it's a public school system. Um, in general, in a public school textbook choosing system, you may be on a textbook committee and they you know, encourage parents, and I would encourage parents to be on the committee. But I was talking to, um, it was Sumner School District mm -hmm. curriculum director about their textbook. And I said, well, why don't you take Saxon Math, which is a really good you know, concrete book and homeschoolers use it a lot. Why isn't that on your list? And they said, They're, they pre-screen the list. You know, there's like, you know, 50 textbooks you could choose from, they pre-screen it to 10, and then they give it to the committee and the parents. And those are the 10 that some curriculum director best felt fit the needs of their school. So you do have a little bit of control bias in that already, and I mm -hmm. doubt that a teacher in a public school actually can sit there and say, I want to have this book. What they can do <coughs> is, is maybe recommend and find out if it's on the list of their approved list of books to begin with. And, then, and even in private schools, um, depending on your school system, they may have a list of books that are approved. One thing about private schools is that due to accreditation of private schools, there are some major private schools, Christian schools as well, that are going common core. So just because you have your child in private school doesn't mean you can sit back and say, I don't have to worry about it. You need to worry about it. You need to share this information with your principal. Mm -hmm. Have them take it up the ladder to their superintendent, take it up to the ladder to the accredit the, the um, whatever the accreditation agency is, because I don't I don't think I've talked to some of the leaders of Washington State. They don't like this. But but unless enough schools complain, they don't feel that they can do anything about it. So we need to complain at all levels. You and I just wanted to say, I, I help coordinate a tutoring program in Quincy, fourth graders, uh -huh. fifth graders, sixth graders, and we're seeing these like color in the boxes, you know, count all these dots and, you know, not learning the long division and, you know, trying to help these kids and not knowing even what they're doing and trying to search on the internet to find some tools to even figure out what they're doing, searching these common core sheets, talking to the teacher teacher says, oh, don't worry about it, you know, we've moved on, it's okay that they don't know that. I mean, and the tutor is going, well, how do we even help these kids if we don't even know what they're doing? And the teacher's justifying that this process is actually really good because the kids kind of learn kind of like... Because the they learn the bigger picture, yeah, exactly. they, they learn how to do integrate, but if but you they don't, don't know the details, <laughs> right, yeah, that's... <laughs> That's why I, the birdhouse example to me was my way of envisioning. You don't learn the tools, but you're asked to do the whole mm -hmm. birdhouse. Is there any groups or your group that is uh, writing legislation and getting somebody to sponsor that legislation to overturn public law? Um, at this point, I don't think that we have the threshold in the legislature or in the people, the citizens of Washington State to do anything. So I highly recommend that you go to, what was that website? Stop Common Core, WordPress, the bottom one there. Mm -hmm. We're trying to monitor interest level in this, in that, that, that is a website that I'm working with the people behind that website. And what we're gonna hopeful is that when it gets to a certain threshold, it's called stopcommoncorewa.wordpress.com. 
that you'll, you'll get great information. If there's anything specific going on statewide, that's the, the website that I will be going to. We don't feel that we have the threshold right now. Um, again, tell all your friends. I'll come back here. You know, get, make sure there's no snow on the ground or in the past. <laughs> and I, I just want to share this because the, we have to get our numbers up. Our legislators know that there's a problem, but there's just this huge intense from the governor and, and everyone. And I have to say the Republican Party is one of the worst in maintaining reform education because they still perceive that the standards is equal to knowledge. And they haven't really kind of gotten into the details of what is being taught to understand that standards-based movement is not about knowledge. It's, it's a different thing that's going on. Okay, question one, two, and then. Hi. Um, I've run statewide initiative campaigns both successfully in the 80s and we won. And starting tonight, right here, right now, I'm going to be starting to write a statewide initiative that will go on the ballot this November. We will throw out common core. The legislature is absolutely worthless. I grew up in Olympia, and I know for a fact that when the liquor runs out, then they close up session. That's basically it. <laughs> There's so much garbage that goes on in Olympia. I appreciate all your efforts. You've done a great job tonight. Your details are wonderful. But going through the legislature, unless you're Boeing or Warehouse or have a billion bucks to hire lobbyists, you're, 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 it's very difficult to get anything through. All you have to do on a statewide initiative is write up a good, uh, a good initiative, get the signatures, it goes on the ballot, and it becomes law. End of, end of story. And I look at Common Core as so many lines on the sand. All you have to do is get the right election. The, the, the ocean wave of people's of voters' discontent will throw out Common Core, and I guarantee it will be done by November. I, I do say, I do think it will have to be an initiative process. Right. And I think that as we go around, um, I just did a show for PBS um, last week in Seattle on, uh, it was actually Tacoma. <coughs> so uh, I, it, it was a panel discussion on Common Core. Um, Lee Finn of Washington Policy Institute and I were against it, and there are two other people that were for it. Hopefully we got better arguments going through it. I haven't seen the final product. But um, th there is momentum, and, and the first has to be awareness of people asking questions, what is Common Core? But no, I agree. It, it's, I think initiative would be the route to go, and hopefully we can raise that threshold of discussion and for negative discussion on it. I, I think there's enough support in this room right now to start it. Who I'll is your name? A week from today. Here. What's your name, man? Uh, meet with me afterwards. Okay. okay. I'll be here. Yes. And, okay. Uh, speaking of the legislation we passed, I've read House Bill 1450, which is, as I understand, and I'm not used to reading legislation, so if I've got something wrong, tell me. But is that says, 2011? No, it's 2013. Okay. It's passed in 2013, and it says we are adopting Common Core, and that the, um, the superintendent was was in his, within his rights basically to adopt Common Core, that kind of thing. But it says a lot of other things in here, as I read it, uh, that would need to be addressed. You can get rid of Common Core, but this legislation still lays a groundwork for the federal government to be involved. There's a new section that says basically that parents have to be notified every year if the what assessments their children will be taking, when they'll be taking them. And one of the things is they need to be notified whether the assessment is required by the school district, the state, or the federal government. Uh, so to me, that's laid the groundwork for the federal government to always be able to require assessments if they choose to do that, if we just got rid of common court. It, uh, it, it talks about them, uh, they need to be notified if the results of the assessments will be used for program placement or grade level advancement. We need to make sure that they're not using these tests to determine if someone moves up a grade. That should certainly be, be controlled at a local so, level. How many of you were told that if you fail the WASO or the measurements to a uh, high school proficiency exam that you can't graduate? How many of you will believe that? Okay. Now, I'll just say that I was in a, a friend of mine was in a meeting with Dr. Terry Bergerson at the time. And she said that. She said, if you don't pass the WASO, you can't graduate. Mm -hmm. And the lady said, you know, well, under what authority? She said, no child left behind. Except that we had a copy of No Child Left Behind in section 1111K, you know, it, it says, you, shouldn't, you can never make a judgment about a student based upon one test. So by federal law, they do not allow you to use one test to stop a child. And I believe that if you are ever told that your kid does not graduate because they did not pass the high school proficiency exam, and I'm working with a mom right now. Legally, that is illegal. 
and we are challenging that because you cannot stop a child from graduating based upon the test. Is a question back there? Did I miss? Oh, go ahead. alarm bell for social studies. First, common core standards for English language arts and literacy in history, social studies, science, and technical subjects. So what's happening is that there's not a separate test member. It's not like knowledge where you're going to have a chemistry test or a physics test. It's about understanding concepts of literacy and writing about science, writing about social studies. It will be embedded in the technical knowledge of what is known as the English language arts. I don't think they're going to have a separate testing system under Common Core. But I'm going to read you an example of what it could look like. Well, this is based upon Smarter Balance. Again, you can get this off the Smarter Balance website. This is a downloadable example on what I would call social studies. So you have a situation where the student reads two articles that are given to them or watches a National Geographic video or something, the, the, the tools of what they're going to write about will be given to them under the testing system. In this case, the, the student has to read an article by excerpts from Objections to the Constitution by George Mason, Mason October of 1787, and the other article they read happens to be Branches of Government by Ben's Guide to U.S. Government for Kids. So one is an article that was written by George Mason at the time of the Constitution was written, and the other is a contemporary website on the Constitution. Mm -hmm. One of the questions the kids are asked is which one is a more legitimate source? Mm -hmm. yeah. The answer is objections to the Constitution. Of course. Because it was written by George Mason at the <clears throat> time when George Mason was writing the Constitution. And Ben's Guide for Government although it may be factual and honest and have good information in it, was written in after the year 2000, therefore, it's bad. That, when I started reading, you can download this problem, one of the questions alludes to that. And uh, the first document is more relevant because it is a primary source. Yet, the first document is objections to the Constitution. So what have they just conditioned the child to believe? Objections are negative. Right. Constitutions okay. all I just want to say, push pull. I believe this is a real example. You can download it off the Smarter Balance website. When I started looking at examples of questions on how they're doing things on the testing system, that another example that I have here is that if the child reads and watches a video on uh, here it is. Uh, it's, it's Phoenix, Arizona, and Seattle. So Robin is moving from Phoenix, Arizona to Seattle. You get to read two articles and watch a video. I think the video is National Geographic. And then you have to answer the questions on um, which the environment, explain the environment mm -hmm. on each, each location. According, according to the video and the article, what are the disadvantages and advantages? And which article describes how Robin feels about moving from the desert to the coastal? This, this is actual test questions that are being offered on Smarter Balance, Common Core Test. And I looked at this, and one of the things that I thought first, who cares how Robin feels about it, okay, you know? <laughs> but the, the concept is, they are going to give the child the articles and the video. If you have a child, say that, that Susie, you know, is answering the test question, his grandmother lives in Arizona, and spends half her summers in Arizona, and then lives in Seattle, really knows the two states. 
if she starts writing something because she's lived in both places that is not in the video, she will get marked down because she has too much pre-knowledge. She knows the situation better. So the part of the Common Core testing system, the Smarter Balance, is to ensure that everybody is equal, it's equitable, it's fair for all minorities, so that you can't have questions that might have somebody's more pre-knowledge because some mother might have read more books to a child than another. So the questions themselves are going to be set up to eliminate pre-knowledge. That is why you see a lot of those questions about write about your birthday, write about your aunt's place, because everyone has a birthday and everyone has an aunt. So, that, that's, um, just kind of keep that in mind, and we're seeing that, complaints from some of the teachers, that it's hard to teach a lesson plan and always be focused on making sure that you don't put too much pre-knowledge of a child into the lesson plan. Um, Excuse me. Kimber Liver just had her hand up. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, thank you. And anybody I missed, just, you know, make sure I... I'm also going to stand up and be too broken at me. I have a teacher. Okay. Um, and we're in the midst of a document for the language arts program. So we have any questions about how we vet textbooks and how we treat them the And what we're seeing with the Common Core. My question for you, and for all of you, is that historically, if you brought out that there's gross incompetency in the writing of assessments, the loss of and the same people in charge of writing the Smart Balance Assessment said they wrote the loss of the grant. Correct. Okay. So let's all get righteous indignation and say, you know, get on our pitchforks and say, let's get rid of the Common Core. My question to you is, who's going to fill? Yeah. Who's going to fill that vacuum? Because the last time we got mad and got rid of the Wassel, guess who filled the vacuum? The same people that wrote the Wassel. So if you want to get rid of the Common Core, you better have a good plan for who you think should be writing the next assessment. Because I guarantee the same incumbent people are going to come into their place and do the same thing that they've been doing. The problems that she's really described uh, with right. free knowledge and all these problems with all these assessments and all this curriculum predate the Common Core. The Common Core is just a new name with incompetence going on. Oh. So when you say, what's wrong with the textbook, or how do I know if it's a good textbook, don't even look to see the Common Core related. Look in the textbook. So for example, the textbook that I want to adopt, it says Common Core on it. But here's why I want to adopt it. It allows me to teach from the Bible, because the Pride of the Sun is a really great piece of literature. It allows me to teach the Constitution. It allows me to teach from the Federalist Group. It's a great book. And I don't care if it says Common Core on it because it's a great book. There's other books that are terrible books that say Common Core. You know what I'm saying? My question would ask would be that it's not, if you have a great textbook, that it's not just off the test. Or teachers, I mean, you know, you're teaching with the test because I love to read. And I would love to have my kids learn about Constitution in the Bible, but it's not on the Common Core test. And that's a really good question because as far as I know, no one's doing the test. So when you say I'm teaching the test, I would love to see the test because I want my kids to succeed. But we don't really know what's next. We see a lot of people saying this is on the test or this is an example of a question on the test, but none of us have seen it. So do you, I mean, do you think when the test comes out, there will be a form for the teachers? Well, teachers have been standardized testing since time ago. So the teachers are going to be complaining about standardized testing. Um, unless they write a really great one, which but how do we know what's on the test if the test changes per child? No two children are going to have the same test question. Okay. Um, and, and, and I also, you, you know, I like that point that you brought up. First of all, right now, the world is talking about Common Core as if this is a great thing. And I mean, it's only recent years it's been challenged. Therefore, you will find, I mean, homeschool textbook writers are putting Common Core because they think this is how you're going to sell it. But Common Core textbooks, right now there is no standard of what is to be taught or not taught. So, so there could be good books out there. You have to go into the details. Okay, don't worry that you have, um, just because it says Common Core may not mean it's a bad thing. I think that's, that's a point. You always have to go to that next layer of looking at what it is. Well, you said in the beginning, we can shape this to be a good thing. Right. And, and, you know, Saxon has a Common Core version of the book, but I'm sure they have 
you know, real numbers in it. The other thing is keep in mind that the, the private schools have been taking the WASO. So they have been not teaching to the test. They're teaching other things. But there's a part of me that believes once you teach a child to think in general, they can answer any question. And remember that as far as a solution, I would like to see not just simply do away with the test. I mean, we, we've got a system that's been ingrained since 1993. What I want to see is a parallel system and bring back norm reference test, bring back something that actually measures knowledge and do that as a parallel so that we could start collecting data to see which really works. And that any kind of testing system that is based upon a performance-based testing is a criteria which you're only testing the criteria. Why don't we bring back some norm reference testing systems in conjunction with that? So, um, I mean, when I'm talking to legislators, I actually said, why don't you do both? Do a pilot project where you're bringing in norm reference tests, you're bringing in knowledge books, you're bringing in a parallel program and see what happens rather than just throwing it, because there was that question that you're always going to get is, well, if you throw out Common Core, what do we have? Well, if you throw out Common Core, you go back to the Washington State 2008 math standards. That, that's what I would say. Go back to taking the standards from California. Go back to something else, not just, you, know, you can't just leave with nothing. Go back to something that's been tried and true. So that, that's yeah, what I would recommend as far as throwing out Common Core. <laughs> and um, did you get your points? And yeah. Okay, you have a question? Yeah, it seems to me that you're saying that Common Core itself, as it stands alone, isn't necessarily bad. It, the curriculum driving it can be lousy. It, it, Common Core is a set of words on a set of standards. Now, granted, I'm going to read you two sets of standards. Um, one is from, actually, I believe this was the Catholic Church stand, standard for mathematics in fourth grade. Identify place values, compute long division problems with two digit divisors, use rules of divisibility. Okay. This, this is um, Catholic. Now, here it is. Um, understand decimal notation for fractions and compare decimal fractions. Generalize place value understanding for multi-digit whole numbers. Generate and analyze patterns. Okay. The common, this is common core standards. Common core standards are vague. They're written vague. It sounds like a curriculum. So, so how, and when, when you say I'm going to um, represent and interpret data, well, you can represent and interpret data with concrete stuff, or you can represent it with fuzzy math stuff. So that's why I'm saying Common Core standard itself, I think is not the biggest culprit as the testing system, which comes next, and then the changes forced upon you because they tell you you have to teach to the test. Yes. Oh, back there? I just want to leave the challenge. Um, my daughter's biggest gripe about, she doesn't like her, her, my grandson's math problem, but she goes to the school, she goes to the open house, she talks to the teacher, and she's always disappointed that out of 30 kids in the class, there's like three parents. In the class. So I would challenge everybody here mm -hmm. who's attended school board meetings on a regular basis. I applaud you for getting on the curriculum committee. Do that. Volunteer to be on those committees. Read the books. Be involved. It's right because it's a good January. Going to the school board, might, and you might not even be on the Senate like, like Patty Murray. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Okay. So, Please. Hey, can you tie in the P20W? I know it's great to talk about all the curriculum, but talk about the you know, uh, step. So separate the okay. So P20W has to do with the tracking data collection and tracking system. The data collection um, is separate from Common Core. So you have laws on Common Core, laws on testing, but then you have the tracking system, which is a separate set of laws. The, one of the tie-ins, though, is that the Smarter Balance test is 100% on the computer. Now they have an agreement that theoretically the federal government cannot act. You know they. There is not, uh, the state is not told to give the information, any testing information, to the federal government. However, Smarter Balance has signed an agreement with the federal government that says federal government can have access to data when the federal government wants it. That's the back door to getting data 
from the Smarter Balance Testing Program the to the federal government. <laughs> and either way, probably the tracking system, every time your child answers a question on the tracking, on the testing system, it will be put into the portfolio of that child in the whole P20W system. Wonderful, they'll be able to track all the children in the country forever. Now the, I, I've got to add something here. Online education. If I told you, and I'm a tax preparer, that the IRS has a really nifty program that all you have to do is go to the irs.gov website, download the program, do all your bookkeeping on it, and you don't even have to worry about preparing your Schedule C. It does it for you. Okay. Would you buy that program? It's free. Would you use that program? The answer no. is no. I've yet to find someone who suggests. So why is it that you are willing to go to Khan Academy? You are willing to go to Connections Academy, Virtual Academy, WAVA program, and download a program off of someone else's website and have your children do the homework on this computer program in your house, and you don't know who owns that program. And you don't know what they're doing with that information, or do you? Do you know what's happening to your child's questions? Do you know what questions are being asked? Most of us who love online education don't feel that it could be dangerous. But my son had to turn in a paper at a private school onto a plagiarism turnin.com website. And when he told me he had to go online to go to this website, what I did was I researched the website found out that the server was in the United Kingdom, they're being sued in New Zealand and some other countries. It's, the internet is a global world. You may have privacy rights in America, but it's owned by Pearson out, no, I'm not, that wasn't, but Connections Academy is owned by Pearson. Whose laws govern the privacy of your child's data? You don't know. So I would highly recommend if you do online education, it's different from going to Office Depot and buying an algebra program loading on your computer, standalone. When you log on to someone else's website, you as a parent need to know what questions are being asked of your child and what data has been collected. Question? This is all my help. Um, something that alarms me is that our children are advancing now in these questions. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I mean, when I started looking at that, <coughs> that, 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 that's not just the knowledge, it's how it's and they can track how they're chasing their views and push um, there's if any of you have a job Psycorps is an employment testing company you go to you go to um, I don't know, a major corporation and they make you take some psychological testing a friend of mine did that and they had a Psycorps program and it had questions like do you believe in universal health care and the answer she said was no and then the next question was well, don't you believe that some people need insurance and it was a push-pull question and then they come back to that first question <coughs> and this was done the company was called Psycorps. Psycorps is a division of Pearson International. Pearson is the largest assessment company <coughs> in the world for K-12 education. So the same company that's doing psychological testings in your employment place owns the, the, the testing programs in K-12 systems. Mm -hmm. And they can be push-pull questions until your child says, yes, I believe in global warming. Mm -hmm. So you don't know that, and that's... You know, it occurs to me that there's a, another maybe more basic idea that we haven't even touched on tonight, and that is the very idea that this top-down mm -hmm. federal government really promoted program, I call it Obamacare for education is being handed down to all of us by the virtually the same people who wrote, who authored the $650 million Obamacare website, stupid.gov. And we're, we're being expected to just swallow it hook, line, and sinker, and 45 states have, including our own. But what about the idea that, according to the federal constitution, Article 1, Providing for education or having anything to do whatsoever to do with education is not one of the enumerated powers of the federal government. That's it. it, it, it that's it why it really the legally, government. the legal rights are that we as citizens can legally take it back. We just haven't done it, <coughs> and we haven't showed up in school. We haven't we haven't fought back and tried to take back control. There is one school district, maybe two. I know one 
that's in this area, that is not that did not sign on to Common Core. All the others, because everything that is in education <coughs> has been uh, voluntarily. I can't. Where go? <laughs> it's a small school district. Well, it's first grade through eighth grade. Um, it's around the Ellensburg <coughs> area, so somewhere around here. There is one school district Rosen. that has not signed on to Common Core, and so and that. They just chose not to, and they don't have to deal with any of this stuff. They have the right. Every school district has the right. Ellensburg was not going to sign on to Common Core right away. They had a lot of questions until the governor called them up and said, if you don't do it my way, we're going to withhold our funding, which I think is illegal. Um, a Coeur d'Alene school board member, they had the same thing. If you don't do it our way, we're going to withhold funding. They said, I challenge you on that. And they looked up the laws, and they said, Superintendent Tom Luna couldn't do that to them, and he knew it. So we just never challenge that. We, we do, and, and it is local control. We do need to take it back from, our, from mm -hmm. locally and then go up the ladder. I believe that ultimately every legislature, if they see the push, they're going to cave. We just have to get our numbers up there mm -hmm. to cave. And that's what's happening in other states. They're getting their numbers up there. Um, one, two, I don't want to miss anybody. OK, real quick. I just, I just want to resonate. What yeah. is it, Rick? Yeah, what you said there. I mean. It's important that we put the government in their proper role. You know, as I've been, I'm running for Congress and seeing that, all the red tape and all the stuff that we're dealing with, the hierarchy of this, the federal government should not be in control of our education. The federal government should not be giving bribes to the states. This is completely contrary to the Tenth Amendment and to the very intent of our nation. And I think it comes back to that in terms of the loss of control. We've got too large a power in this. The other concept I've got to mention is yeah. that the federal government, a lot of this stuff is the recommendation of 